It's hard to calculate the impact that philanthropy has had on medicine through the centuries. Here at Johns Hopkins, it's responsible for more than just the inception of our institute. In 1915, Diamond Jim Brady gave a donation that made the opening of the Brady Urological Institute possible. And today, we stand on the shoulders of the men and women who've come since Diamond Jim Brady and have helped us on this journey of discovery. That journey has included advancements that have redefined urological care for millions, saving lives and enhancing quality of life. Pioneering breakthroughs, like the first radical prostatectomy in 1904, ushering in the era of surgical interventions, to the first purposeful nerve-sparing radical prostatectomy, preserving sexual function, the Brady has contributed tests, techniques, and training that are standards of care around the world. Looking to the future, researchers continue to expand our understanding of the genetic components of disease, providing life-saving diagnostics, surveillance, and treatment. My history with Hopkins and my personal histories are, are actually interwoven. I'm originally Lebanese, and at age 16, I came to the United States, and boy, did that change my life. Because of the situation in the Middle East, I had to make a new home for myself here in the U.S., and dealing with that adversity, that challenge, that uncertainty really shaped me and really instilled in me a, a level of concern for people, a level of care for people, because just like me, you know, everybody comes to us with a story and, and really it, this is what Hopkins and the Department of Urology is, is all about ultimately. And this led me to now be the director of this uh, department, which is uh, very surreal. My vision for the department is in line with the vision for Johns Hopkins Medicine broadly. We're a growing healthcare system and expanding access to patient populations that previously did not have access to Hopkins quality care is very important to me. What started as a single hospital has grown into an integrated network with locations in Baltimore, Howard County, Washington DC, and Pennsylvania. Every year, our footprint expands, allowing us to bring Hopkins quality care to more and more people throughout our community. And with virtual telehealth visits, we're meeting patients wherever they are. Additionally, expanding the size of our department to be able to provide this access. But through this expansion, we also hope to bring people into the field of urology who traditionally were not represented in our field. Less than 10% of our urologists are, are females, and even less are underrepresented minorities. And one of my big initiatives is to enrich our field with a diversity of thought, diversity of approaches, so that we can do better for our communities, but also create better research. So we're very proud that we've started this work at Hopkins, and we'll continue to do that. Today, with the increasing complexity of diseases and sophistication of technology, the costs of medicine have never been higher. But the Brady Urological Institute is committed to pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Innovations including customized 3D modeling, augmented reality, robotics, and more, the Brady will continue to develop and implement the latest technologies to deliver the very best in patient care. I'd love to widen the array of research offerings that we have. We will always focus on prostate cancer, but we are doing so much more in many other diseases, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, pediatric urology, reconstruction. There's so much more that we're doing to help solve the problems of today and, and tomorrow. And all of that is made possible by philanthropy and partnering with our patients. People come here expecting the best, and I'm incredibly proud to lead this group of people who've come together with a common goal of quite simply delivering the best care. Good afternoon and welcome to Urology Speaks, a new era of the Brady Institute. As you saw in the video, my name is Mohamed Allah, and I am the Jokursky Family Director of the Brady Urological Institute and Urologist in Chief here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the first of three Urology Speaks sessions this academic year. 
This series originated during the pandemic as a way for our team to virtually engage with patients, donors, and friends during a time when we would not be able to safely host in-person events. We continue the series because it provides a wonderful opportunity for us to share good news from campus without anyone having to leave the comfort and convenience of their home. As you saw in the video, uh, the Radiological Institute was founded in 1915 thanks to a transformative gift made by Mr. Diamond Jim Brady in grateful acknowledgement for the care he received here at Johns Hopkins. Partnerships with our patients continue to drive the incredible work of the Brady. The trust that you place in us inspires us to ask challenging questions and pursue research that will improve clinical care. The philanthropic investments you make fuel these efforts and advance our, our mission. As you hear about my vision for the next era of the Brady Urological Institute, I hope that you too are encouraged to continue and perhaps expand your partnership with us moving forward. Our agenda is ambitious, but together I know we can achieve great things. I'd like to speak for a few minutes about some of these ideas, but please know the majority of this session is devoted to answering your questions. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit a question at any time, and I will answer as many of these as I can. And so with that, I'm gonna start and, and talk a little bit about some of the things that I, uh, that I touched on in the video. And one of them is the uh, expansion of access to excellent urological care across our region here through our integrated healthcare system, but, but beyond and, and nationally and maybe even internationally. Uh, and, and this is important because uh, the only way to disseminate the knowledge that we learn here, which translates to care, is to reach patients uh, outside of the walls of Johns Hopkins Hospital and, and beyond. Johns Hopkins is an integrated healthcare system, and we now are a mu multiple hospitals, Johns Hopkins Hospital here in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins Howard County Hospital, Johns Hopkins Sibley down in Washington, DC, and of course, Suburban Hospital, uh, which is also in Maryland, but in what we call broadly the National Capital Region in Washington, uh, DC. And we'd like to improve and increase this access through uh, hiring physicians and creating teams in these areas, but then also leveraging telemedicine to expand the footprint of the care that we provide uh, nationally and also internationally through Johns Hopkins Medicine International um, and, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, another area that I think is important in the future is the area of leveraging big data and uh, from a scientific research standpoint. Our, most of the research that we've performed and others in medicine today has lagged many industries in terms of its ability to harness the data that we collect on uh, patients. Every CT scan and MRI and ultrasound carries with it a lot, of, a lot more information than what we see. These, this is the quantitative information behind the dots that are on the screen when you look at a CAT scan. Uh, every uh, uh, genetic uh, material we have also has a multitude of data. Uh, every pathology slide from a biopsy, whether it be a bladder biopsy, a kidney biopsy, a prostate biopsy, also carries information beyond what the pathologist can see. And being able to leverage that quantitative data with all the other data that we have on patients that are the typical clinical data and, and uh, information that we have on sex and age and, and hair color and, and uh, family history and medications and all those things, and be able to, to do analytics on uh, this data to be able to better inform us, to help us make better decisions 
when there's uncertainty, which there always is in medicine, is I think the promise of uh, what we can deliver uh, tomorrow. And, and with that, one of the big visions that I have is, uh, is what I call the digitization of urology, which is to create these uh, digital data lakes, the data, and we put it all on a cloud server. Here we call that the Precision Medicine Analytics Platform. And this data repository, data lake, sea of data, whatever you want to call it, is agnostic to the way that we would analyze it. So if uh, Google comes up with an analytics platform that can look at data and learn from it, we would be able to use that. If we have our own proprietary, we would be able to plug the data into any of these platforms and be able to, to answer scientific questions like, what are my chances of, uh, uh, of dying from the cancer that I have? What are the chances uh, that I uh, recover this function or that function? And I think uh, that's going to be a big uh, area in, in the new era of uh, data analytics uh, and precision medicine. medicine. Uh, the way we teach, which is one of our four missions, medicine and surgery, I think is changing rapidly. And the old adage, you know, in the old days, we used to say, see one, do one, teach one. And to, to a large portion, that caused the uh, inception of what we call the um, apprenticeship model of, of teaching. But now as we're using robotics and advanced imaging, there are opportunities uh, to use virtual reality and augmented reality uh, to also use um, 3D printed models uh, where we can create patient specific models. So somebody has a kidney tumor, we can print a mold of their specific kidney, of their specific blood vessels, of their uh, urinary system, and put it all together and actually connect the blood and the urine and be able to operate on it and practice the operation. And, and these things are reality. We're doing a lot of that today, but we'd like to expand what we could do using these advanced technologies so that when we get to the operating room to do a case, it's not the first time that we've done that specific case with that specific patient. And with that comes a lot more technologies. Uh, the, the era of molecular imaging is here. And, and, and uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, this is the injection of um, a, a dye of sorts that binds to specific cells. Let's say in, in the case of kidney cancer, something that would bind kidney cancer, and there are markers, and then would light up and we could see it on a scan but also perhaps we could see it during surgery so that we can make sure that we clear all the cancer. And we have some clinical trials coming online using these types of markers in prostate cancer surgery. And, and this is the uh, future of surgery, smart surgery, we call it, uh, which I think is, is incredibly uh, exciting. You know, the Brady is known uh, for, uh, Oncology, prostate cancer being our anchor disease. Uh, Diamond Jim Brady had a prostate ailment uh, and, and we've led in the area of prostate cancer probably more than any other uh, institute in the world. And I, I would like to think of the next era as building upon that. So we'll always be, as I said in the video, strong in prostate cancer, and we're gonna double down on prostate cancer. It's an important, important disease. But we also have to think beyond prostate cancer, bladder cancer, benign diseases of, of, uh, of in urology. These are benign tumors, uh, enlarged prostates. Uh, reconstructive surgery is particularly important. As we get better at treating cancer, we're seeing survival rates of cancer increase, but those patients are living one longer, which is great, but B, with potentially uh, side effects from the treatments that they've had. And while we've gotten better and better with the treatments, there's no question that there's more room to be made in that. So technical advancements will always be something we, we yearn for, but being able to reconstruct the urinary tract, the, geni the genitalia, et cetera, 
uh, to circumvent some of the issues that arise when someone gets radiation or has a surgery that leaves them with side effects, I think is important. And that ties in to pediatric urology. We've gotten so good at reconstructing uh, the urinary tracts of kids, children born with congenital uh, problems that as they become adults, we, you know, we now are in an era where a lot of the children that have been helped by new techniques have become teenagers and beyond. And we need uh, the uh, experts uh, caring for them, for them, and and innovating them, uh, innovating uh, uh, for them as well. Um, so you know, these are just a few of the sort of um, things that I'm concentrated on. I, I'd like to say, I see, as we said in the video, to see an increase. We we're, we have an influx of uh, uh, of people coming into urology that traditionally didn't were not in urology. Uh, you know, uh, females in urology make less than 10% of our workforce, but we take care of a lot of women in urology. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we need to uh, do better uh, to, to uh, be a little bit more inclusive in our field uh, with women and underrepresented populations. Uh, and, and you know, how do we do that? It's a multi-pronged approach, uh, but, but, it's, but it starts at the grassroots level, uh, pipeline programs, uh, you know, uh, hiring deliberately so that we have representation, so that we're, we are an inviting specialty for, for everybody, and not just uh, uh, men like me. Um, I, I'm going to stop there with sort of my just soliloquy here. And uh, there's a couple of questions on the Q&A uh, that have come up that, uh, you know, we can kind of go through and, and I can talk a little bit more about some of these things. And please, the Q&A is, 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 uh, is open, so um, I'd love to see uh, questions that you have. Uh, one question that may not be related to the vision, but now that you have become director, will you have to reduce your load of patients and surgeries? Um, and I would say, unfortunately, <laughs> because I do enjoy taking care of patients, uh, and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and it's one of the things uh, that I enjoy the most uh, is operating and uh, seeing patients and taking care of them. Uh, so I, I will have to decrease that, uh, but honestly, not in a significant way. Uh, so probably cut it down by about 30% or so. So I will still be seeing patients and um, and taking care of them, but but certainly not at the level uh, you know uh, that that I that I am today. Um, you know, a, a question uh, uh, about what is the state of the art today in non-invasive surgeries? And, and I think that's an excellent, uh, it's an excellent question. So when I was training, um, we were doing open surgery. You know, if someone had a problem, we fixed it by making an incision and we uh, then did the surgery and closed the patient. And that comes with pain, increased hospital stay, increased con convalescence, and increase in blood loss, blood transfusions in, in our surgeries uh, were not uncommon. As time has gone on, urology has become largely an outpatient specialty. 23-hour stays or, 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 or shorter have become the mainstay of a lot of the things that we do. And how did we do that? We made the incision smaller. So from open surgery, we went to laparoscopic surgery. We then went to robotic surgery. And now to answer the question, we, we have a lot of image guided interventions um, that are, um, I'd say state of the art. And an example of that, they don't exist in all of our special, in all of our diseases, but one example of it is uh, someone who has a small kidney tumor. It's on the backside of their kidney and it's on the outside of the kidney. So it's right there you know, easily accessible by a needle through the back. Uh, we have technologies that we can put needles in, in, in that tumor and freeze it or cook it, use an ablation modality. We have uh, ablative modalities that are non-invasive, ultrasound waves that can go in and cause uh, energy to destroy that lesion. And perhaps a very uh, timely uh, example of that is the field called theranostics. 
And this is important. Uh, and, and we're gonna hear a lot more about it in the future. I told you in my sort of little speech earlier that we can inject dyes that have molecular agents that bind to certain cells. So let's say we use the example of kidney ca cancer, but, but we'll, let's keep that example. So you, you could inject that dye, it binds to the kidney cells and fluoresces, and then you could see it on an image. Well, imagine that you can use the same dye, but instead of have a fluorescent molecule on it, add a radiation particle. So now it can go bind to the specific cell and then emit radiation locally to that cell right there and then uh, and cause damage. And those treatments now exist, this ther theranostics uh, in, in prostate cancer, there, there is a lutetium-based therapy uh, based on PSMA, which is the molecule that binds to prostate cancer, that's now being used in metastatic prostate cancer. And we're trying to find roles for these uh, uh, non-invasive therapies earlier. Can, can you do that when someone is diagnosed with prostate cancer de novo? Um, but, but, but that is kind of a glimpse of the state of the art in um, non-invasive um, uh, surgery. And, and the next question actually touches upon perhaps the most uh, non-invasive uh, therapy, and that is the therapy of doing nothing for certain cancers. We know that as, we get, as we're getting better at detecting things by CT scan and ultrasound and MRI or by a blood test, like for prostate cancer, the PSA test, that we're, we pick up a lot of growths and tumors and nodules, and not all of them um, you know, are, are, we're meant to die with. In fact, we know now uh, uh, through work done in prostate cancer by Valentine Carter, work done in kidney cancer by myself, Dr. Parazio and others, that there are some tumors that are the pussycats and others that are the tigers. Um, and, and we could watch, we could watch them. And, and the question is, this is a patient who's been participating in the prostate cancer surveillance program since 2012, so 10 years. So somebody diagnosed with cancer of the prostate 10 years ago, and they went on what was called at the time expectant management. Today, we would call it active surveillance. And I would say that, and the, and the question is, can you please expand on the concept of active surveillance? And believe it or not, since 2012, we've expanded the indications for doing nothing but just monitoring for more and more prostate cancer patients and more and more kidney cancer patients. And we're starting to explore it in others. So for example, in kidney stone disease, it used to be that if we saw a kidney stone in the kidney, we'd say, well, it's gonna grow and cause problems and infection and it may drop in the ureter when you're traveling. And we would get scared, the patient would get scared, and that would lead us to treat all of these things, when in reality, we now have learned through uh, um, research done, a lot of it actually at Johns Hopkins, that we don't have to do it. And, 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 and how do we know that? Well, we have markers today uh, that can inform us when someone is diagnosed with an ailment uh, to help give us more of a sense if it's a pussycat or a tiger to be able to make that decision. And some of the markers are imaging tests. So now we use MRI more and more with prostate cancer. With kidney cancer, there's a, a test, a molecular imaging test called a Sestamibi scan that we can do on people who come to us with kidney tumors. They've been told their kidney needs to come out. And we do this test and the thing lights up and we say, aha, uh -huh, this is a pussycat, not a tiger. And therefore we can watch it. There are blood tests also that can help, and it just depends on the scenario, but there's a battery of tests that can help risk stratify, and we're still learning and trying to develop more of them because the ideal would be to not operate unless we absolutely have to because every action has a reaction. And, and while we're very good at taking out things, uh, no matter how we are, we good we are, there are uh, recovery periods, there's complications, long-term effects, uh, et, et cetera. So, so, uh, so that, that's a great um, uh, question. Uh, another question that I think is, is um, 
is is critical is um, you know we now have to really poke and prod to find cancers. Um, you know, for prostate cancer, we have to do a PSA test followed by an MRI, followed by a biopsy. Uh, for bladder cancer, uh, we have to put a scope in the bladder and we have to do a biopsy there, et cetera. Uh, are there ways to non-invasively uh, detect cancer? And that is an area of great, great research. And you, many of you probably have heard the term liquid biopsy. Liquid biopsy meaning uh, getting a biopsy from blood or urine, and um, and and you know getting a patient's urine and testing it and finding some marker in the urine or some marker in the blood. And Ho Johns Hopkins, through work at the Ludwig uh, Center uh, for Genetics, which is led by Bert Vogelstein and and others, uh, including work also done here. Uh, at, the, at the Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute by uh, uh, David McConkie and Noah Hahn and Max Cates in, in the bladder cancer arena, work done by Christian Pavlovich in prostate cancer. Um, it is the holy grail, I would say. Um, there are a few tests. There's one actually commercially available to screen patients. I just don't think that the test that's commercially available and what we have today is there is is there quite yet? Uh, certainly, for some can cancers, there there are better tests. So, what do we look like? What do we look at in the blood? We look at DNA in the blood. The cancer spills DNA, and we can detect cancer DNA. We can uh, detect um, circulating tumor cells. So, a, a, a tumor sheds uh, cells into the blood. And, and there are ways to do uh, what we call CTC analysis. And there's a uh, commercial test for prostate cancer that looks at exosomes. These are small vesicles that form in the urine that have proteins and other material in them. And we, we find a signature when there is a cancer. I wish that those are ready for prime time as standalone tests but we're getting very close. We're getting very close. Um, so, so that's kind of where, where we are that. A question was on, on free PSA for, for prostate cancer. So when someone has a PSA that's elevated, it raises a red flag that maybe something's happening in the prostate. And then we look at things like free PSA and the prostate health index. Now we have MRI. And, and all of these, I think, help I call them indicators, kind of like you're, you're evaluating a stock on the stock market and there's arrows that go upwards and downwards that help you make decisions on them. And these are similar. So a percent free PSA, since the question was asked about that, if that's elevated, the, the percent free, if there's more free PSA floating around, that is an indication of benign disease of the prostate. If the percent free is low, the PSA is all coupled and bound, that's usually more associated with, um, with, with cancer. Um, there is a question that I think is very interesting, data tracking surgeon performance. And, um, you know, we, we actually have internal report cards that we issue to our surgeons and um, that look at certain metrics um, and, and, and this is the, uh, a, a, I, I would say, very uh, futuristic look because I, I think um, surgeons operate, they see patients in clinic and they have a, a feel of how they do. Um, they have, uh, it's anecdote, there's recall bias. Um, most surgeons think that they're the Michael Jordan of the operation that they do. Um, it's part of surgical uh upbringing and hubris, you have to be competent to be a surgeon. But the reality is it, it is humbling when one looks at uh, outcome data. And so the how do we track surgeon performance? There's one way that's futuristic. And as we do more and more robotic surgery, we're learning that you can tell a lot about how a surgeon operates and performs from the movements that they make in the robot, moving the robot around to, to operate. 
Uh, for example, economy of motion is a hallmark of an expert surgeon versus someone who's, you know, not so good. And, and these relate to outcomes. So the ultimate is to look at the outcome itself and say, okay, how many of these have you done? And these are your outcomes. This is how often cancer, uh, is, you know, is potentially left behind, which hopefully is a, is a rare occurrence. This is how many times your patients bleed. This is how, how many times they come back to the hospital within 30 days. This is your length of stay. And, and we've created these, um, I would say, currently still primitive report cards, but they have these outcome data. And we show them to people and we, see, we show them where they stack relative to others in our system. It's one way to maintain quality and for someone like me to see how people are performing. And then we found that showing people the data actually improves their performance. And that's something called the Hawthorne effect. If people uh, know that they're being monitored for a certain metric, they improve that metric. Uh, so if, if I told somebody, we're gonna judge you on how nicely your hair is combed every day, uh, people will start coming with nicely combed hair. I mean, that, that's, and we found that, that, that that's true for, for surgeons as well. And, and that alone, just showing them that data has improved things. But we're, we're certainly in this, um, I talked about virtual reality and augmented reality and 3D printing in terms of training. We're very interested in uh, surgeon-specific performance on technology where you could easily monitor how, they, how surgeons move their eyes and how they move and relate them to outcomes and be able to pick up trainees early in their training and say, hey, listen, maybe you shouldn't be a surgeon. You know, maybe we're, we're just not destined to be because today you invest six years and then you go out and start practicing. And if you're not a good surgeon at that point in time, boy, that's that's a big investment. And it's very hard for people to tell that person that they shouldn't do it. So a lot of exciting things in the air, in the arena of competency, skill of surger, surgeons, uh, but also on a quality and value in medicine, especially as we build an integrated healthcare system, how do I monitor someone at Sibley Hospital in Washington? I need to be able to look at dashboards and data and be able to show it to the surgeons so they know how they're doing, but I know how they're doing, and, to, and for that to affect uh, change. Um, you know, a, a good question came up about, um, you know, BCG. BCG is uh, actually a tuberculous uh, vaccination. For, for those of us who grew up abroad and for those who are tuning in from abroad, uh, we've, I've been vaccinated with BCG, but that's for tuberculosis prevention in areas that see a lot of tuberculosis. But, it, but believe it or not, for those who are not familiar with it, it is a treatment for bladder cancer. So if somebody has um, superficial bladder cancer where you know, we're not gonna remove the prostate, they don't need real kind of chemotherapy, we put BCG in the bladder and BCG uh, makes your immune system activated and that activation of the immune system fights bladder cancer, and it's actually a very, very effective therapy for certain types of bladder cancer. And it's usually done after we remove the tumor um, through a scope procedure. Um, and then we, we usually do it, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, weekly installations, and, and we put it in the bladder and let it sit for uh, a little time, and then the, the patient uh, urinates it out, or we remove it through a catheter. The question is, so that, that's an interesting concept and the concept of immunotherapy, using your own immune system in this manner and in other manners is something actually that Johns Hopkins has been very active in and a lot of the early studies and a lot of these things happened here. So how do we harness this to fight cancers beyond bladder cancer is an important thing. And I just finished a phase three study looking at that in kidney cancer in localized kidney cancer. And this was an international trial, 900 patients. And we, we just reported some results uh, in Paris at the ESMO conference in it. So interesting, the immunotherapy story, and we can talk a little bit more about it because it is something we have to, uh, as, a, as a, a leading department, uh, be involved in and lead in. But the question here is on 
BC, BCG shortage. BCG is um, one of these drugs that is, um, uh, you know, while it's not on patent, uh, it's um, competitors have been driven off the market so that it's really being, uh, and this is one of these perverse stories in our healthcare system here in the United States and globally. So it, it's really being manufactured by one company and there's a shortage. It requires a biological plant, especially. And so the question is, how have we handled the, the shortage? Well, we've learned that you could split the dose of BCG so you could decrease the dose and get the same, so we can get more bang for the buck and spread the amount of BCG over more than, more than one individual. Um, and we've also learned that you could use alternative chemotherapies uh, in that setting. And, and Max Cates, uh, Noah Hahn, Jeannie Hoffman Synthesis, Armin Smith are incredibly well uh, versed on this, Sunil Patel, uh, and, and have done a great job uh, dealing with this. And here in Baltimore, we haven't run out of BCG. I know it's been an issue at some of our other sites and, and the patients have come to us from Washington, DC uh, to get BCG here. So, um, so we feel like we have a good handle on it, but it is a, a national and international problem that is, I think, gonna require attention from higher up legislation and, and us being advocates uh, nationally uh, uh, on, this, um, you know, on, on this issue. Um, let me see here. Um, what are you most excited for in terms of discoveries that can be applied in patient care in the next five years? Yeah, I mean, excellent, excellent question. And, and we've, I think, touched, uh, uh, touched on some of these, um, you know, uh, issues. Um, I, I think that, um, in, in the area of uh, big data, I, I really believe that we're going to be able, uh, and, and this is not far-fetched, we, 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 we have um, the, the basic infrastructure for this, but that the future drug, if you will, is not gonna be, I mean, yes, there's some chemotherapeutics, there's new immunotherapies, but, but the new drug will be harnessing the data that we have on our patients, the biological specimens, the radiology, the pathology, and having it live on this cloud, as I, as I discussed, and creating uh, artificial intelligence around it. So this is a living sort of data repository. And we, in the clinic, ask questions about a patient who sits in front of us and say, what do you think this patient's chances are of dying of heart disease in the next 10 years versus their cancer, so that can help us make a decision on which one should we treat and, and what have you. And, and, and then that data repository learns from the outcome of that patient. And it's an iterative pro process. So this concept of having, um, um, you know, this uh, uh, living artificial intelligence feedback loop, I think is gonna be critical, uh, you know, maybe, so, so that's one. Another is our, our understanding of resistance uh, to therapy. So how does uh, cancer become lethal ultimately? Is it develops resistance to the chemotherapy that we give or to the therapies that we give? And, and we, we have some initial really good data on um, a, cell, a cell type uh, that Dr. Pienta here is work, has, has, I think, uncovered and characterized that we believe is key in, in resistance. And so drug therapy to help uh, kill that cell, I think is gonna be important. And then I think technology is gonna play a big part. Technical refinements, non-invasive treatments, um, you know, which we've you know, kind of discussed a little bit, this theranostics idea. And I think we're gonna enter a new era of reconstructive uh, urology and organ sparing. Uh, urology. The standard of care for bladder cancer is to remove the bladder. It's a very morbid operation, leaves you with, you know, lots of side effects. Uh, being able to do, treat the cancer without removing the bladder or to make a bladder that's not made out of bowel so we don't have the complications that come with it. 
I think that that um, that would be uh, uh, a big a big uh, deal in, in, in that. Uh, let's see here. Um, this is all very intriguing, but as a new leader who is building a new Brady, what do you need to make all of this happen? Do you have what you need now? Where are you falling short? And how does research directly relate to patient care? What is your grand research vision for the Brady? And what is your grand patient clinical vision for the Brady? Wow, that's a, a, a great question that I think we could spend you know, hours um, talking about. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky to be at a place where I have great faculty, I have engaged faculty, I have great uh, trainees, because those are the young creative minds uh, who do a lot of the work uh, that we need to do to take things to the next level. But, but certainly a lot of the work that we do requires investments. So one example is, we are currently landlocked here in the Brady. Uh, we need space, so for example, to do this in silico work with the big data and the, the uh, computational biology, artificial intelligence, we're gonna need space uh, to house a team. Uh, and so we need, there's a space requirement. Uh, there's a big building coming up uh, uh, here next door and we need to make investments to uh, get a floor or maybe even more uh, of that, we, we there are some uh, uh, investments we need to make in equipment uh, to help us uh, do to do this. But there's also human capital, which is the most important, and, and uh, funds to be able to uh, get the brightest minds to come and work with us, and give them the resources that they need. And and with that is uh, an in investments in, in in that human capital. Uh, and funds to be able to do high risk, high reward work. Because if we're doing um, the work of yesterday, um, it's not exciting, but, but if we're doing the work of tomorrow, it's actually very hard to fund. And I'll give you an example. The FDA, our, our you know, uh, uh, sort of federal uh, drug administration, um, if there is a drug today that I can give to someone that's recently diagnosed with prostate cancer that can virtually make their prostate cancer vanish. There's not actually a very good uh, regulatory pathway to get that drug approved by the FDA. The FDA wants to see, we gave it to patients who are dying of the disease and it helped an overall survival, which, which I get, but they're looking for a drug that's gonna cost three months survival benefit, six months survival benefit, and if that same drug were to be used earlier in the disease, it doesn't work because the disease is different early in the disease. So if we were to go to the FDA, the NIH, th those types of things are actually not as easily fundable as one would think. And so this is where philanthropy comes in to be able to give us the tools to do some of this high risk, high reward, uh, innovative uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, work. And so, um, so that's, that's some of that. Uh, I know that that's maybe touching on this and touching on that, but I wanna get to some of the uh, questions uh, here. Uh, what's the department's relationship with the NIH and has it helped? We, we have a great rela relationship with the NIH. We definitely um, uh, compete successfully, as successfully as, as a urology department can for NIH dollars. We're also very successful at getting Department of Defense dollars so uh, government organizations that fund research are, are organizations that we build great relationships with. As you know, as you may know, uh, we put grants together that we apply. And through the years, the, the score that you have to get on a grant has uh, become uh, harder and harder because the dollars allocated to uh, funding the things that we do in urology have uh, have decreased and decreased uh, uh, through the years. And so it's become increasingly more difficult to get NIH funding, but, but it's not impossible. And we do compete successfully for NIH funds, Department of Defense, the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, the AHRQ, PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. 
These are all government funded organizations and we have active grants uh, from all of this, but, but, but without philanthropy, we would not be able to get the preliminary data to, to compete for those grants or to do some of the more innovative uh, uh, work and to support young investigators. So if a urologist finishes training and they can go and practice, practice clinically, produces revenue, produces uh, salary, support, or they can sit in a lab and do research, um, they're not going to be paid as much doing the, the, the lab. And increasingly, we're seeing, especially with the younger generation, um, that they're less interested in the research career because of the financial detriment. And we need to have funds in places like Johns Hopkins, because if we're not producing those people, no one will, and, 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 and science will take a big hit. And thankfully, thank, thankfully because of donors and, and philanthropy uh, and, and support from our institution, we, we've been able to support those individuals until they get on their feet and are able to get grants and then you know mesh clinical work with lab work so that we can do the innovative work uh, uh, that that um, uh, that we need to um, that we need to do. Um, let's see. Um, I heard something about a doctor in Baltimore being able to perform surgery in a different country. Is that possible or on the horizon? Um, uh, yeah, yes, it is. It is possible, and we do have relationships through Johns Hopkins Medicine International with a few institutions around the globe, and so we certainly have traveled myself and others, and have done surgery. Uh, some is 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 uh, kind of more mission level work to just you know help and give back to to uh, uh, less fortunate people, uh, and and some has been you know, uh, just to, to go and do a week and, and, uh, and, and operate uh, in other uh, venues, South America, the Middle East tend to be the two biggest kind of venues for this. Um, I had a call last week with a, a new company that's looking to uh, expand telesurgery. You know, urology is well suited to the concept of telesurgery, um, which is a big concept, obviously. The ability to, since we do a lot of things that are technology based, that are robotically based, how great would it be if we could expand access to the surgical quality here by having remote surgery? You know, having a robust, safe, redundant uh, um, uh, uh, system to be able to do uh, surgery from Baltimore on someone uh, first in Washington, D.C., second in Nebraska, third in California, but fourth in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that that's as far as people think. And it's one of the things I'm interested in expanding, um, but, but that will has uh, legal ramifications, licensure ramifications, uh, and, 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 um, and, and issues like that. But, but I think that we're gonna see, just like telemedicine has expanded and our recent infrastructure bill expands uh, broadband uh, for many people in the middle of the country. And, and we'd love to be able to reach them, but not just in consultation, uh, but, but potentially in, in surgical uh, you know, uh, expertise. Wow, this, this uh, Q&A board is, uh, has uh, exploded, so which, is, which is great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to, to see it. Um, um, to see that. Uh, a good question, how much do you need to raise privately on an annual basis to do the work which you would like to do? And are you reaching that goal now? Boy, uh, a great pointed question. Um, I'll be you know, fairly transparent. We, uh, our operating budget in the Department of Urology is uh, about, I'd say, 20 to 25% of our operating budget in the department globally is based on philanthropy. So, uh, so philanthropy represents about 20% of, of that budget. Uh, it depends year to year on, on whether we were able to kind of raise the amounts that, 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 you know, and thankfully Alyssa and her team are outstanding. And last year we had a great year where, you know, I think we, we uh, our, our annual uh, sort of fundraising uh, was about $17 million. Um, 
which is, you know, it was at a healthy uh, number uh, for us. Uh, and, and, you know, we would love to be around that, that number. And that includes uh, current use philanthropy. So these are cash gifts that, you know, we use as they come in. Uh, and, and I think many of the people I've seen the list of this and it, and it warms my heart to, to see some of the names um, uh, from, from the recent past, but some from the distant past. And, and uh, it would have been nice to see people face to face. Um, but those are, but those would be, uh, uh, you know, sort of cash current use. And then we also do depend on endowment funding. Endowment funding is usually larger gifts uh, that sit in the university forever. And there's an interest that accrues on the investment from that uh, corpus that then kicks back to the department and we're able to use it uh, for various things. Some of the philanthropy supports uh, research time for faculty, uh, some uh, uh, supports uh, education, because the educational mission is an unfunded mission and it doesn't generate revenue. Uh, and one of the big things that we do is teach and prepare the leaders of tomorrow. And we're proud that, you know, many of the uh, chairs of urology at other big academic centers are Johns Hopkins Brady trained. And, and, and that's something I, I want to continue, if not expand. Um, and then it, obviously it, it funds a, a good portion of the, of the science uh, and, and that it supplements government grants, it adds to it, or it is a precursor uh, to it in, 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 many, uh, in many ways. Um, let me see if there's one that I can answer before we call it uh, uh, time. Um, there's a question about, uh, is there, uh, a time in the near future where, where we may unveil a technology or therapy that supersedes the need for a radical prostatectomy. So again, we're getting to the, to the concept of replacing surgery. Um, you know, I don't know that, that uh, we're a year or two away from that, but I think as we understand the biology of prostate cancer, I think we're gonna expand who we don't have to do anything for, the active surveillance, and there may be an in-between treatment, uh, the concept of focal therapy, which is problematic because prostate cancer is a multifocal cancer. It's, it's usually in multiple areas. But if we can get good at seeing the cancer and detecting it, even if it's in eight areas in the prostate, can we zap those eight areas precisely without causing collateral damage and putting people uh, uh, through, uh, through you know, radical therapies and recoveries and potential uh, um, you know, side effects. Um, you know, given our time constraints, I think what we'll do is I'm going to wrap it up, unfortunately, uh, but perhaps I'll ask Alyssa to see if we can, you know, save the Q&A and perhaps we can, you know, mail something out with, with uh, uh, some information related to some of the other questions that I unfortunately did not get to. And, and, and honestly, I'm trying to talk and I, and I like to talk about these things. So I, I get engaged and excited and then I'm trying to monitor the questions at the same time. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, thank you for, for joining us today and, and for the excellent questions. I, I'm so grateful to have your enthusiastic participation in this conversation and honestly in other conversations that we've had and I value your contributions. Uh, please note, if you've enjoyed today's session, consider joining us on Thursday, March 30th for an in-depth discussion on living with genitourinary cancer and navigating recovery. And this will be with Drs. Nirmish Singla, and who's one of our urologic oncologists, and Jamie Wright, who's one of our reconstructive uh, surgery uh, and, um, a, and our certified urologic nurse practitioner, Kristen Farling, who uh, does a lot of survivorship work uh, for us. And if you have any questions or would like to learn more about how philanthropy drives the work and the research that we do here at the Brady, I encourage you to reach out to our development team. Uh, their, their contacts can always be found on the uh, uh, closing slide. Uh, and I, I hope that you found this engaging, and I, I know it's uh, maybe a little of this, a little of that, uh, but, but at least uh, if you get the sense that I'm excited about this, uh, hopefully the excitement is contagious. 
Um, I have big shoes to fill. Uh, I'm honored to be in this position. And, and I uh, really hope uh, as we do one of these events, maybe in a few years, um, I can share with you some of the wins uh, that we've had and, and how we've advanced the field uh, together. Um, so thank you for spending time with us today. I hope to see you all soon and uh, stay safe. Thank you so much.